Hi y'all, it's Miss Strahan. These are our principles of evolution notes. And if you're following along in your packet, we're gonna be on pages seven through 12. We're gonna start off with some vocab in the boxes at the top of page seven. Your first term, which is about what this whole unit is about, is evolution. Its technical term is the biological change process by which descendants come to differ from their ancestors. What that means is how over many generations, descendants look different than their ancestors did. And the key here is it is over a long period of time, thousands to hundreds of thousands to millions of years. It happens over generations. It does not happen in a single lifespan. This image right here is of a horse ancestor from 55 million years ago, which clearly looks different from the horses that we have today. The face was smaller, the legs were smaller, and that's actually because this horse lived in the forest and had to climb over little rocks and fit between trees, which is different from where modern horses would be found in the wild now. Another term you need to be familiar with is species. A species is a group of organisms that can reproduce and have fertile offspring. And so there might be some organisms that look really, really similar to other organisms, but if they cannot reproduce and their offspring are not fertile, then they are not part of the same species. Now, the second part of this definition, have fertile offspring, is because there are some species that are different species that can reproduce, like a horse and a donkey, but their offspring, a mule, would be sterile, which means it cannot have its own offspring. A population is all the individuals of a species that live in the same area. Here, we need to define the population by area. So you could have the population of penguins in the entire world, or you could have population of penguins on an island. Variation is just a difference in physical trait. It's all the variety that we have of something like these shells right here, or hair color, or eye color, or height, or types of stripes. Things like that are just variation. It's just a difference. It's not good or bad. It's just a difference. An adaptation is a variation that is beneficial. It is good. It's a feature that allows an organism to better survive in its environment. So an example is this snowshoe hair right here that has fur that turns white in the winter so that they can blend into the snow. And it has these large furry feet that act like snowshoes so that it can travel easily throughout the snow. When talking about evolution, we have to talk about Charles Darwin. He's known as the father of evolution. He was an English naturalist and geologist. He was kind of just a wealthy dude um, who had some time and had some money. So he went on a five-year voyage aboard a ship called the HMS Beagle as part of a survey expedition. And what that meant was they were just going and finding information. They were surveying an area. He, in 1859, he published a book um, called On the Origin of Species, which is why he gets so much credit for um, coming up with evolution, although he wasn't the only person at the time to have this idea. He was just the one who published first. Charles Darwin was known for going to the Galapagos Islands and making a lot of his observations there when he was traveling with the HMS Beagle. So I just want you to see where the Galapagos Islands are located. This is them right there. This is going to be um, the lower part of Mexico over here. There's Belize, Guatemala, and then we have South America down here, Panama right there, just so you can kind of get some perspective of where he's located. The Galapagos Islands are really perfectly situated. They are far enough apart that these species were able to evolve independently of each other, but they're close enough together that their ancestors can be found on different islands. And so we're actually able to see some really cool relationships happen because of just kind of how perfectly distanced these islands are from each other. So now we're gonna talk about some key observations that Darwin made during this expedition um, that really helped lead him to this theory of natural selection and evolution. So first off, there were two organisms on the Galapagos Islands that he noticed looked different from one island to another. The first was the Galapagos tortoises, and he noticed the ones that lived in areas with taller plants actually had longer necks and legs, and the ones that lived in areas with shorter plants had shorter necks and legs. He also noted that the finches that lived in areas with hard shells had stronger beaks. The ones who ate fruit had smaller and softer beaks. So we started to make these connections that it seemed like these species were really designed for the environment they lived in. 
So his first observation really led to the second observation was that he realized that species are able to adapt to their environment. Now it's important to note that this does not happen in a single generation. That means if a bird is not fit for its environment, it's probably not gonna survive its environment. But over time, a species can adapt to its environment when some of them are able to survive. So adaptations can lead to a genetic change in a population because pretty much the main idea is if some of them can survive and have the adaptations that allow them to survive, they're gonna have more babies and you're gonna see more of them in the future. Another one of the realizations that Darwin had that kind of went against what people thought at the time was that the earth was different previously. So originally people just kind of assumed the earth always looked like it currently looked, but Darwin found some fossil and geological evidence supporting that there was this ancient different earth. So some of the fossil evidence included fossils of extinct animals like this glyptodon right here that resembled modern animals, specifically the armadillo. You can see it in their shell and their armory. He also found fossil shells high up in the Andes mountains. This gave evidence that Either the mountain used to be below sea level or that the sea used to be higher up where the mountains were. So it showed that Earth could change. And he actually got proof of that when he witnessed an earthquake that actually caused land from underwater to move above sea level. So not only did he have the fossil evidence, but he literally saw the Earth change in front of his eyes. And that actually gave good evidence to support the idea that like, okay, if that can change, what else can change? Maybe we did have different animals. Maybe they've changed over time. So it really opened the door for all these other options and all these other ideas of how Earth was different and why it became the way it currently is. We're on the top of page nine now, FYI. So another thing that led to Darwin's idea for natural selection was that he knew that artificial selection was already happening humans were able to select traits through breeding, like in dogs, um, and they were able to create certain fruits and vegetables through breeding desirable traits in plants. These next few slides are from an online article called 100 Years of Breed Improvement. And I just wanna start off by saying it's a biased article. Um, it talks about, like it, it you know, has some judgments, and so I'm not here to judge, and I wanna make sure we know when we're looking at articles, um, the judgments that are there. If you read these descriptions, you're gonna see some of those judgments, but they also do have some good information. So we're gonna take the information from it, but not necessarily um, the judgments. But these are examples of dogs that have been interbred so much that um, they actually look very different in just 100 years. So I'm not gonna read all the descriptions, but feel free to pause and read them if you want to. This first dog up here is the Bull Terrier, and you can see how different its nose shape is. This is the Basset, down, Basset Hound down here, and it has back problems. These are actually two of my favorite dogs, but you can also see how they have evolved over the years. And again, feel free to pause this if you want to read um, some of the health issues that these dogs are impacted with. So one of the reasons I'm sharing this is I do think it's important for us to notice bias when we are reading things. And so if you look here, they're talking about the German Shepherd. Shepherd, they use the term ruined breeds and say that they used to be awesome. So those are opinions right there. But there's also going to be facts here that talk about um, that it's barrel chested and has a sloping back. We actually have information on how much it used to weigh versus how much it weighs now. So those things are facts. And so we have to, when we're looking at information that we find online or in newspapers, be able to distinguish facts from opinions. Another term I want you guys to know is fitness. Now you may have heard the phrase survival of the fittest and not known what that meant. Well, what fitness is, is it's the measure of survival ability and the ability to produce more offspring. In other words, if an organism is a fit organism, then it can survive in its environment. But not only can it survive, it also needs to be able to reproduce. That's really key when we talk about evolution, because remember, it's all about change over generations. So they have to have offspring and able to have change over generations. Another one of Darwin's observations was that there's the struggle to survive due to overpopulation and limited resources. 
that means not everyone's going to survive, which is why you hear about survival of the fittest. This is your final bullet point at the top of page nine, that Darwin would propose that adaptations arose over many generations. And that's really key here, that they don't just show up when they're convenient, they have to already be in a population, and then they will show up more and more over subsequent generations. Here is our definition for natural selection. It's in that middle box on page nine. It is a mechanism by which individuals that have inherited beneficial adaptations produce more offspring on average than do others. In other words, organisms that have these good traits, they're gonna have more babies. Those babies will have the good traits. Those organisms will, those babies will grow up and have their own babies. And we're gonna see this good traits over and over again. So here's a simple example of how natural selection would work in the environment. So over here, we have this population of gray and white mice, but there's a gray background. When this bird comes by, it is going to easily be able to pick out the white mice. The gray mice, they have the beneficial adaptation. They are going to survive and produce more offspring. And so we are going to say that they have a higher fitness than white mice. Another phrase you might hear is that gray mice are selected for and white mice are selected against. There are four main principles of the theory of natural selection. I kind of rephrased it on your notes page. We're on page 10 now and just say, I'm just saying that these are the four things that natural selection requires. The first principle that natural selection requires is variation. There have to be differences among a population for natural selection to act on those differences. In other words, if nothing's different, then nobody benefits. Nobody is fitter than another in a, um, individual. So we have to have a bunch of variation, like the different skull sizes in these jaguars. Now, these variations can come from a parent, or they can even occur randomly from a mutation. The second requirement for natural selection to occur is overproduction. What that means is having more offspring than the environment can handle. The reason we need this is because there needs to be some sort of competition where having a beneficial adaptation helps some organisms survive and reproduce more than others. If there's not any competition and everyone reproduces equally, then you're not going to get this change in a population because nothing will be beneficial over anything else. The next thing that they're required is for some of those variations to be adaptations. Now, remember when we talked about the difference between variation and adaptation is variation is just any difference. Some differences aren't beneficial, they're just differences, but some differences are beneficial and those are adaptations. So in this example, what actually happened with jaguars is you had jaguars of differing sizes and they ate a combination of small mammals and possibly some um, hard-shelled turtles. Well, there was a, an extinction that caused a lot of the small mammals to die out. What were they were left with as a food source were these turtles with really hard shells. The jaguars with smaller jaws could not crack those shells and they actually couldn't get enough food to survive, but the ones with the larger, stronger, powerful jaws were able to eat these turtles and they could survive in this environment. This is actually a perfect example of how originally their jaw size was just a variation, but when the environment changed, jaw size, a large jaw became an adaptation. It became beneficial. The fourth principle to the theory of natural selection is called descent with modification. Now this is the hardest one for people to understand because it's just phrased weirdly. But what this means is the descendants of the offspring are going to have this modification, whatever this change is, if the environmental conditions continue to remain beneficial for that trait. So here's what this is saying. We just said that, that jaguars with large jaws, that was beneficial because they could eat those turtles. Now, if there continues to be a shortage of small mammals to eat, and if the main food supply continues to be turtles, then in future generations, we are going to continue to see that having large jaws is beneficial. So over time, you're going to have more and more offspring with large jaws. That is descent with modification. And that's actually truly what 
evolution is. That is that change over time that we would see. But it's only going to happen if the environmental condi conditions remain beneficial for that trait. So if the rodent population and small mammal population increases really quickly in the next, you know, couple years, then it's no longer going to be beneficial to have a big jaw and we're not going to see that change. It has to stay beneficial for us to see the change. Another important point to note is that just because a trait would be beneficial doesn't mean it's just going to show up for no reason. These traits have to already exist in the gene pool. So while it might be really beneficial to be able to breathe underwater, if we don't have that trait in our gene pool already, humans aren't just going to be able to breathe underwater because we want to or because it would be beneficial. The trait has to already exist in the gene pool. One cool thing that can happen though is that structures can take on new functions in addition to their original function. And so an example of this would be a panda. They don't have opposable thumbs like we do. That means they don't have the thumb, like a thumb that can make a circular motion and grip onto stuff. But they have this evolved wrist bone right here that actually can act like a thumb and help them hold onto things, which is why they can grip bamboo and eat it like the picture on the right. All right, guys, we're on our last two pages for this section of notes. We're on pages 11 and 12. And this is where we talk about all the evidence we have found since Darwin's time and during Darwin's time for some of this that shows evidence of evolution. So one of the first um, examples of evolution is fossil evidence. And that was from Darwin's time as well. But we know that fossils in older layers, those deeper layers, are more primitive than those in upper layers. That phrase primitive means kind of older and simpler. They're not as complicated as the ones in upper layers. There's also geographical evidence for evolution, specifically that island species most closely resemble the nearest mainland species. Populations can show variation from one island to another, but they're going to be closer related to the organisms that are closer to them. We have this term known as biogeography, and it's just the study of living organisms or previously living organisms around the earth. And we're actually able to see that there are fossil remains of similar organisms in closely related areas or even the same organism that is spread out um, over areas that may not be connected anymore. So this is kind of a rough model of the idea of Pangaea, that supercontinent that's separated. And there's evidence that Pangaea probably did exist because we have fossil evidence of similar species found on continents that are not connected currently, but would have been connected if Pangaea existed. So now we're getting into some of my favorite evidence of evolution. These are known as anatomical homologies. So think about anatomy, body structure, and that prefix homo, remember, means same. So these are similarities on the body structural level. And what that means is these structures are similar in structure, but different in function. They could be similar in function too, but this is evidence of a common ancestor. And a great example is the bone structure of mammals. And so here you're going to have four mammals, human, cat, whale, and bat. And although our arms or flippers or wings have very different job. So the job of a human hand is different from a cat's paw, very different from the flipper of a whale and different from the wing of a bat. However, they actually have the same structure. They have a large main bone coming off of the shoulder followed by two bones connected to that. You can see it over here in the whale and with the bat. And then they're gonna have the carpals, metacarpals and phalanges as well. So this is evidence of a common ancestor because all these organisms likely evolved very, very long ago from an ancestor that had this similar bone structure and it continued to work even though it changed. It continued to be kind of that blueprint or that starting point of the bone structure. We also have these structures known as analogous structures. Now these things are tricky because they seem like they would be related, but they're not. So an analogy is a relationship where something is similar. And in this case, we have a fly wing and a bat wing. They have a similar job or function, but 
that doesn't mean they actually have a common ancestor because this fly is an insect, this bat is a mammal, and they did not evolve from a common ancestor. So these are known as analogous structures. Vestigial structures are evidence of evolution because they are remnants of organs or structures that likely had a function in an earlier ancestor. So a great example of this is any sort of function, any sort of structure that just kind of seems useless right now. And we're like, why does this even exist? Well, it exists because it was necessary in a, an ancestor. So ostrich wings are a great example of this. Wisdom teeth are a good example of this. Um, the appendix is a good example of this. Those are all vestigial structures. You can think of them as the leftovers. All right, guys, final page of notes on page 12. These are some things that we have learned um, more recently just with some of the technology that we have. Remember that that word homologies means similarities. And so developmental homologies are similarities in development. This is actually through embryology and it studies the embryos of different species. And you can see that at the beginning, even though a lizard is different from a tortoise, from a pig, from a human, we all kind of start out looking like this little curved lizard creature. Yes, that's a human right there, and you looked like that at one point. And then through development, started to actually develop our different characteristics. This is evidence though of a very, very distant common ancestor because at some point, we all have the same blueprint of how to start out developing. Molecular homologies are gonna be the newest homology that we know of just because we didn't have the technology for this previously. Molecular homologies mean similarities on the molecular level. And what we're really looking at is DNA sequence analysis or amino acid sequence analysis, which really does come from DNA. But being able to compare the similarities in DNA can tell us how closely organisms are related. So you might think a hippopotamus and a humpback whale aren't related because they live in such different environments, but they actually are close ancestors and one bit of evidence for that is their very similar DNA sequences. All right, two more terms for you and then we are done. Our first term is known as convergent evolution. Now to converge means to come together. And so convergent evolution is when two distantly related species, so they are not related, they become similar, they come together because they have similar characteristics. A great example of this is a shark and a dolphin. Sharks are related to fish, dolphins are mammals, they are not related to each other, but they do have similarities. They have dorsal fins, they have flippers, they have tails, and the reason that they have these similarities is because they live in the same environment, not because they are related. Divergent evolution actually is evidence of a common ancestor. To diverge means to split off. And so in this case, we have our original ancestor and then it diverged into somewhat different characteristics because the organisms needed them for their environment, but they have that common ancestor. So that is known as divergent evolution. And that's the end of your notes, guys. Thanks for hanging out.